Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar titled Large Scale Thermoset Additive Tooling Advancing the CAD to Tool Process. It is brought to you by Composites World and presented by Magnum Venus Products in collaboration with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. My name is Ginger Gardner and I am Senior Editor at Composites World. Thermoset materials have been used in composites manufacturing for decades, but Magnum Venus Products, MVP, recently developed a new system, a Reactive Additive Manufacturing or RAM system to offer new potential using thermoset composites in high performance markets. The RAM system enables stronger, more energy efficient tools with improved thermal properties and can achieve FDM scale features while still, still delivering a high output. Our primary topics today will include differences in large scale thermoplastic versus thermoset composite printing, exotherm and conformance to optimize parameters, applications for the RAM system, and integrating RAM into the Industry 4.0 landscape. Our presenters today are Mike Castura, Senior Product Manager at MVP. He leads the Thermoset 3D Printer Project at MVP and has extensive experience in product management, operations, marketing, and business development in a broad range of industries. Mike has an MBA from the University of Tennessee, a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of South Florida, and is a certified project management professional with the Project Management Institute. His co-speaker today is Dr. Chris Hershey, R&D Associate in the Manufacturing Science Group at ORNL. Chris is the project lead in large-scale reactive polymer additive manufacturing. He jo joined ORNL in 2018 as a postdoctoral research associate in the Polymers Materials Development Team, which is located in the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility, or MD MDF. He obtained his PhD in chemical engineering from Michigan State University and now directs his experience with the rheology of thermoplastics, thermosets, composites, and phones to develop and advance additive manufacturing. Thanks again to all of you for being with us today. And now I'm going to hand it over to you, Mike and Chris. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Should we turn our cameras on now too? Is that how this is supposed to work? I'm sorry. Uh, sure, go right ahead. Okay. So my camera's on. All right, so hello everybody. And unfortunately you also have to look at Chris and I during this uh, presentation, so you're welcome for that. All right, this is gonna be weird because I can kind of see you guys over here. Okay. So, of course, now it's not moving. Okay. So as mentioned, um, my name is Mike Castera and Chris Hershey will be the other presenter today. And we are from MVP and, and Oak Ridge respectively. Uh, real quick, what we're gonna kind of go over today is just um, some of where, who we are and, and where we've come from or where, who we work for, the thermoset advantage of why you're using thermosets and what, what is that advantage kind of look like. Chris is gonna go into some of the material development that has happened over the last two years or so or three years. Um, we're gonna discuss a little bit about uh, the reactive additive printing and, and what's going into that and what are some of the benefits there. Um, what are some of the outputs of that, some of the tools and where does this all go next? So MVP, if you don't haven't heard of MVP before, they're, uh, we're a global manufacturer of fluid movement and production solutions and um, mix and metering equipment. And what that really kind of means for us is what are some of our core competencies. These are our divisions of how we kind of look at ourselves as a company, but our core competencies of pumping solutions and, and precisely mix and metering is, is one of the core competencies and the second core competency of automation, using these big machines to do, to utilize some of the first core competency and, and, and make these bigger machines work. And so it was a natural evolution for MVP to get into the thermosat large scale 3D printing because you're really combining these two core competencies and, and enabling something that um, has not been able to been achieved and then working with ORNL as, as a partner and, and as a collaborator to help us move the, the technology forward. Yes, and so uh, in collaboration with uh, Magnum Venus Products, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has uh, been working with them since uh, about 2017. 
And Oak Ridge uh, National Lab is, is located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There's roughly around uh, 5,000 employees there. We are one of the largest uh, national laboratories in, in the sense of our research capabilities. Uh, we are the most diverse, having everything from uh, neutron sources to uh, ma uh, materials uh, development and the, the fundamental uh, level, all the way up to um, uh, leadership class uh, supercomputing. So uh, we had the, the largest uh, supercomputer at one point, known as Titan. We were then beaten out. Now we are opening up our uh, new supercomputer system, Summit, which will be the, uh, the largest uh, system uh, available in the world. Uh, we have about a $2 billion uh, uh, expenditure uh, budget. And uh, one of our main areas that we, we uh, strive on is in the manufacturing uh, area. So where I'm from, and Mike, if you can go to the next slide, is the manufacturing demonstration facility. So the manufacturing demonstration facility is a ORNL user facility. We are located off site of, uh, of the main campus. So we are in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, there is where we work uh, on a variety of uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, most of it is in the additive manufacturing space, working with metals uh, to polymers. Uh, we've uh, been a key uh, player in the area of research and development for large-scale uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, the large-scale thermoplastic system developed uh, with ORNL came out of here in, in about 2014. And then uh, now we are working on the large-scale thermoset uh, system as well. Next. So yeah. to just to level set and make sure everybody really gets in the mindset of thermosets versus thermoplastics, I do get made fun of for the slide often, so I'll, I'll put that out there right away. Um, but if you think about thermo the differences, it, or if you think about 3D printing in general, most people would immediately go to thermoplastics. That's what's been on the market, both um, from a lab scale or from a home recreational type offering, all the way to what has been uh, the large scale so far is all thermoplastics. And what is really happening there is you're melting a plastic down and, and putting it putting it out, putting it on whatever material you're on your on your bed or whatever. And and that's not what we're doing in thermo sets. So it's really kind of if you think about butter versus pancakes. So butter at a at room temperature, at ambient temperature is hard and you have to melt it, you have to add heat to it. It goes to a liquid state, and then as it cools back off, it it solidifies. So in a thermal plastic printer, you're you're adding heat to that, and it's it's becoming a liquid butter, and then and then hardening. Thermo sets is more like adding a couple different mixtures, a couple different ingredients together, and somehow you blend those together, and then they form a pancake. And in thermo sets, in some cases, they will have a exotherm themselves, they will add heat by the reaction of these two chemicals or, or multiple chemicals that are coming together. Obviously, that's not really happening in pancakes, but that'd be pretty cool. But, it, or you're adding, adding, you're making this pancake batter at a very, very thick level, and then you're adding heat to it later to turn it into a, a hardened pancake. And one of the differences, it's really hard to make your pancake go backwards, where butter, it's a little bit easier. So if you think about Again, if, as you think of thinking through of the, the 3D printing process, think of it in that sense that you're depositing butter on, on something versus a mixture or a, can, a pancake batter. And, and that's it's really a big difference. Oh, and, I, and it really comes down to that it's a, it's a chemical um, reaction that's happening. And there's a lot of advantages that are happening because of this. And, um, and then we're, we're gonna go into that a little bit more. This is the machine that we are referencing here. So this is the RAM machine that's currently located at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. The build volume on this is 12 feet in the front by 8 feet deep by 40 inches tall. You can see on the right side there that's a, a keyboard and a, and a computer system there. So that kind of gives you a frame of reference of how big this machine is. The tent kind of thing on the top is a is a ventilation um, hood for the for those chemicals to be kind of sucked out but 
So the advantages of both thermal sets printing and the thermal sets themselves are uh, the, the fact that we are using a chemical reaction and, and through that you're getting additional strength. Because you're not melting these two, two beads together and you're actually using a chemical reaction, you're getting a stronger Z layer as well uh, in your print. In general, thermal sets have, uh, are more heat tolerant, so you, you're getting a higher uh, TG value. Um, you're also gonna reduce your thermal expansion in many cases because you're using thermal sets. And in some cases, if you're not adding any fillers, if you're not having to add carbon, say for example, for strength, um, or you're not adding anything into your mixture, now you're talking about having an isotropic expansion. So not only are you reducing the total expansion, but you're making that expansion that is happening isotropic. So what we're talking about here is trying to get closer to um, metal tooling or, or making things that are have the same properties as metal. In general, it's a simplistic process using thermal sets that would be simplistic because you have an open layer time because the bond is is chemical as we've as I've mentioned several times uh, you don't have to come back to that previous layer in the same way you do have to with thermal plastics so there's not a timing issue that the bead is cooling because you've melted the butter, you've melted this piece of plastic, and there's not a time that you have to come back to that previously deposited la layer but to, to make the next layer stick to it. So in theory, you have an unlimited open layer time. So, so now your build dimensions are really a limitation of how big your machine is or how big you are able to deposit these things, not how fast you can come back onto that previously deposited layer. Also, because they're thermoplastics, they, the things that you're making will be easier to repair. You know, you, somebody's using, moving a tool around in the shop and a forklift hits it, you have to repair that, you know, accidents happen. So if you're using the same material to repair it that you use to build it in the first place, and it's a chemical bond, that repair is gonna, be, is gonna go much easier and um, much more effective for the, whatever you're using it on. Another big difference in thermal sets versus thermal plastics is you can print through a previous path. So again, because you're laying this, this pancake batter down in a way that it's not hardening, it's not starting to cool off and harden, now you can actually go through a previous deposited layer without uh, kind of raising the surface of that layer. Uh, obviously there's limitations to how many times you can do that, but um, so now we're talking about different strength geometries and, and different advantages, and, and it really opens up some of the uh, slicing that you're doing to make that part. It really opens the freedom that you have in designing your parts. Because the, the tools then are the objects are made out of thermo sets, you're gonna have um, stronger material, stronger bonding, and then in some cases, the coatings that you're putting on, if it needs a coating, now you're coating it with a more like substance, so you're gonna have a better bonding, and eventually, or in one, some of the cases we're gonna show you, we're, we're moving towards eliminating those seals and coats because you're making it out of a material that you ultimately won't need a coating on. It's, too, it's very similar to that coating to start with. Because of that open layer time that I've, I've mentioned several times, now you're able to integrate a pick and place system because you're not limited to the time that you have to have that deposition head come back. You can have a, a separate pick and place system that's automated, and I'll show you an example of that here in the presentation, of where you're dropping in sensors, um, you're dropping in cooling channels, or whatever you need to drop in to, um, to add benefits to the, the part you're putting. And secondary bonding, I, I've already kind of mentioned that. The, the current system also has a removable print table. Because you're not adding heat or because you're not having to do a lot of different things, you're able to now remove that table. And in effect, you're able to uh, utilize this machine in a, at a more effective rate. And as I mentioned, the, you're not adding heat, the chemicals themselves are adding heat or in some, some uh, materials you'd have to post cure them so you're not adding heat on the machine necessarily 
but you're not using anything to melt the beads. You're not having to dry them up, the beads or the material up front. So because of that, there's a, they're much more, the machine itself is much more energy efficient. So in, in the long run, you will save money operating a machine like this. Um, ORNL, the EPRI did a, did a study on the performance of that and showed that the RAM system was 500% more energy efficient than any other article that had been tested in ORNL to this point. Um, but there is a ventilation system that may or may not have to be added. The environment you're in may already have that, but um, to be fair, would, there is a ventilation system that would probably have to be added that would add some of that energy. But that, I, to be honest, I'm not sure if that was part of that test or not. Um, and then the materials in general will, should continue to be affordable because in some cases you're not having to add the high end, say carbon to add strength. The materials themselves already have some of that strength. So in theory, you're, you're not adding additives that in the end add extra cost. This is a slide just real quick on a real high level of how we got here. So we started on the left side of working with some different formations and how lower build volumes, printing a sparse to solid uh, print pattern in the top left here. So you're saving on print time and materials that you're having to print. And you can see as you go further, as you go from the bottom to the top there, you start infilling and as you would have a surface there. The bottom left one is to just showcase some of the crossover that's happening as through a, a, a print through process. And once some of that was done, then we started moving into height. Um, these are very generalized statements. There's obviously a ton of work that goes in between all of these, but uh, we were able to start building height. The picture there in the center, that was an ACE award a couple years ago sh showcasing some of the thermal set print that I believe that was uh, three layers high uh, a print and was printed for uh, 12, 13 feet um, and using a various lattice design. The bottom picture in the middle is a kayak mold that we had in the Camex demo demonstration booth last year. And we were pulling parts off of that in the demonstration booth last year. That, that, um, it's a kayak paddle head in the center there. So that is a foot or so by a, a foot and a half by six, seven inch, or I'm sorry, three or four inches tall. Top right is a, as we started again, starting to be able to build geometries and different height levels. That's a shower insert piece. And then the bottom right, we started adding, developing other materials. Um, most of these are, these are either a mixture of vinyl ester or an epoxy that Chris is gonna go into in detail some. Um, but our most recent print it was for design concepts, marine concepts. You're looking at uh, a print that took it took about 80 hours to print. And in front of us here is that's about uh, three feet wide, and it's about 10 feet deep that it's printing. Eventually, this print will be almost two feet tall. And you can see on the left, on the outer bands of the tool itself, we have a, a solid print. And in the middle, you see some of the sparse. And in the very middle, you have the formation of, of the tool that's being made. This is going to be a uh, carbon infusion tool that they will use to make some of the big yachts that they make. Uh, you can also see the lights kind of flickering on and off in the background here. Some of this was done at night but the majority of this print was done during the day. Again, because of that open layer time, you're able to print during normal hours, go home at night and start the machine back up in the next day and, can, and resume printing. Whereas in traditional thermoplastics, you can't do that. You have to go start to finish. And if anything fails during that, the, in theory, or for most part, your your tool, your print is scrapped. Whereas in this case, you you can pause, you can stop, you 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 can adjust things on the fly as necessary. Um, but this is uh, over a thousand pound tool, and uh, is to, to our knowledge the, the largest print. It's our largest print that's been done, and the largest thermoset print done thus far. All right, so I will uh, 
I'll take it from here. Um, basically, yeah, that part that you just saw there was uh, uh, our largest uh, our largest part. Um, it was done with our um, vinyl ester resin system as produced by uh, Pollent. Uh, that's their PRD 1520. Basically, the, uh, the system itself is an ambient cured uh, resin system. Uh, it's a vinyl. Uh, it's a vinyl ester. Ambient cure meaning that as we're printing, uh, there is a chemical reaction uh, occurring, and so we go from being a paste-like uh, 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 consistency into a solid cured uh, part that we can remove off the bed. Uh, a little bit of a, a, a detailed explanation between thermoplastic and thermoset AM. In traditional thermoplastics, uh, what ends up happening is uh, in, in the large scale system, you typically start off with a feedstock that's in the form of polymer pellets. Those polymer pellets are rigid. Uh, they uh, have to first be melted uh, before they can be processed and deposited in the form of uh, a layer uh, to layer uh, uh, AM uh, system, in, in a layer to layer AM system. Uh, the the way that they operate, uh, it's very similar to a relaxation modulus of the material. So for those that are unfamiliar with it, basically uh, the, the polymer chains will undergo a series of relaxation modes starting off in its glassy state where it's, it's most rigid and then going through a transition region into what is known as the plateau and terminal region. In the plateau terminal region, that's where uh, polymer chain entanglements take place and you get a polymer melt, and that's where it's being processed. And as you can see on the diagram on the left, that's basically the, 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 the path that this polymer undergoes uh, when we get into the ideal deposition zone. But the moment that that polymer melt has been deposited, and it's uh, it's losing heat now to the environment as and as such it's beginning to cool and solidify again. In the thermoset case, what we do is we start off with a rigid system uh, with a with a paste that it, uh, has a rigidity that's dependent on the type of filler network that forms inside of it. We can put in fibers, clay, uh, we can put in uh, um, micro balloons. The, the, the range of fillers that we can uh, put in is, is uh, very diverse. And uh, the, the, main, the main emphasis behind thermosets is that uh, that filler structure is what gives you your print stability, your bead stability. And in the ambient uh, reaction case, what can end up happening is that that exotherm that Mike was referring to can actually cause a decrease in the overall viscosity of the, uh, of the material when it's in its uh, printed bead. That decrease in viscosity because of the increased temperature from the exotherm can actually cause it to uh, do a complete failure, complete collapse. And in the large scale system, this is, this is strikingly different from what is observed in the, uh, the small scale uh, because we have so much more mass to consider. We have a lot of thermal mass that is uh, generating heat and that, uh, that exotherm can be a significant role in, uh, play a significant role in our ultimate uh, uh, buildability. But if we do control that minimum viscosity during the, re, uh, during the cure uh, cycle, uh, we can actually stay in the ideal deposition zone it can proceed through its reaction, and then we can actually then get a solid cured part that we can pull off the bed. Next. And so in the vinyl ester thermoset process, uh, the, basically the way that it operates is that, um, as you can see on the right of the machine here, that's the pumping station that, uh, that we have. It's a ventilated environment. We are currently operating the vinyl ester system out of 55 gallon drums. And the transfer pump will send this material into a, uh, a hydraulic metering section, at which point that will then send it to a depth of the, uh, the gantry, which has its, uh, its mixing head. And really what happens with the mixing head is we have two uh, streams that are coming in and being mixed together. One is the vinyl ester resin, and then the other stream is the initiator feedstock. And we can control based on uh, the, the metering section, what the ratio of that is. Uh, and ultimately when they mix together, that's, uh, that's where it's being deposited and it starts its, uh, its reaction. And uh, after several minutes, we'll start to uh, uh, get gelation. 
uh, waiting a little longer, we'll get our thermal front for our exotherm, and then the exotherm can actually go ahead and advance the reaction even even faster. Uh, so next slide shows an example here of uh, of actually the exothermic behavior that I'm referring to. So what this is showing is this is an IR image of one of the uh, prints that we've done where the white uh, region is the hot region. That's about 77 degrees Celsius, and it's this is actually really Beautiful video showing the uh, uh, the thermal wave front that you can see. So you deposit the material, the material is coming in at ambient temperature, and then as it's being deposited onto a warm substrate, it's accelerating the reaction, which is then releasing more heat. And so after you deposit a cool material, you start to get this uh, this thermal wave front that follows. And so that, that can actually uh, be uh, de dependent on your geometry, which is something that has to be considered as well when we start building these parts. But we were able to control this exotherm, which led to our printable resin, uh, the PRD1520. Uh, and and, and, and that, that also brought about some interesting challenges that we saw with the thermoset. So controlling the exotherm, one of the biggest ones, but managing volatiles is another important aspect. So Mike talked about the ventilation system that is on this printer. Uh, there is Ventilation booths is where we keep the feedstock lines. We also have a, uh, a lid that goes over top of the printer uh, to uh, restrict airflow coming down. Uh, and then there's a downdraft table that's located beneath the print bed, which is where we uh, pull the, the volatiles out. Uh, ORNL has uh, a very uh, tight tolerances on what we can uh, have for volatiles in the work area. Uh, the Current safety standards is that we need to have uh, less than two parts per million outside of the work environment where the uh, where the operator would be located at. Uh, styrene, for instance, has a uh, an odor threshold of 0.5 millimeters, so it's very sensitive. We're very sensitive to uh, having that uh, that that nose for it, and so uh, basically. Uh, that was one of the biggest challenges with working in this system, and those challenges are present in many different types of chemistries. Uh, pumping and accurately mixing these systems as well. Uh, so MVP, as they already discussed, they came in with a, a, a wide range of knowledge in the pumping uh, of, of these materials and the mixing of these systems for uh, the, their gel coat systems, for instance. That technology, uh, coupled with ORNL's understanding of, of uh, uh, large-scale AM uh, has actually provided a very accurate uh, uh, pumping solution for uh, the, the AM process overall. Uh, material properties varies with the different systems that we work with. Uh, biggest things that we look for are uh, the chemorheology. What is the chemical kinetics effect on viscosity? What is the uh, exotherm like? How is that going to affect the structure of a bead? And so on. And that, that can really dictate uh, what our bead needs to have for formulation-wise, the material system, and also what is the, the final end use of the product. So if you have certain mechanical properties you need in the, uh, in, in the part, we need to take that information and apply that into the paste that we're printing with. And so putting all those variables together is really uh, where uh, we have, over the last couple of years, uh, been very successful at on this. Uh, so here's an example, for instance, of just like the breadth of, of availability of, of resins and the additives that we can put in. I've mentioned already the ambient cured system, ambient being that it reacts while it's being printed and that it can be a hard part that's pulled off. There's other systems too, like latent cured system. Not every, uh, not every thermoset can actually uh, be uh, reacted in a, uh, a room temperature environment. Uh, some need uh, are latent cure, meaning that they take a significant amount of time in room temperature environments, or they need to be uh, post-cured or uh, actually cured in an oven setting to begin with. So we've worked with latent cured systems as well. We've worked with Dixie Chemical on uh, on epoxies that um, uh, will they can be stage over a period of uh, a few days and be hard enough to pull off, but they're not quite fully cured, so they do go through a post-cure themselves or they, they can be pulled off directly and we can have a, a slow ramp rate, which will lead to a, a solid part. Uh, other things that we've printed, yeah. So basically uh, we have a variety of, of resins that we've worked with, but the biggest things that we've, we've looked at are 
uh, three three main ways that describe the successful uh, the successful um, thermoset additive manufacturing space, and that's that's printability, buildability, and pumpability. Printability is just how stable is the print bead. If you take a paste and you deposit it through the uh, uh, the the RAM system, will that uh, paste maintain a bead or will it spread out because there's no filler that uh, or no structure that's being developed? And and so that that goes back to that exothermic behavior. We we first did some experimental uh, calculations on that that uh, uh, resin system, found that it had a very high uh, uh, exotherm. That caused uh, when we looked at uh, a side profile of a part that was being printed, um, we we found that we could take IR data and start to look at every layer, the temperature versus time. And when we did that, we found that at the early stages there was this very large spike in the the uh, the temperature. And really, what ended up happening was that the material, as it was being laid down, every time the the reaction would proceed, it would lose heat through the print bed. And after uh, about four or five layers uh, being deposited, the material itself that was not fully reacted because it was losing heat. Uh, actually ended up becoming an insulative layer for the next layers that could be uh, stacked on top of it. And as those started to react faster, they accelerated the reaction before uh, with with the uh, the remainder of the the layers below them. And that entire heat generation uh, spiked and, and allowed for it to uh, to shoot up uh, into a high temperature region. And then as layers were stacked on top of those, uh, you had more surface area for heat to be dissipated through the system. Um, and we we did numerical results, uh, found that we were able to match these trends, uh, understood a little bit more about the reaction kinetics, and it really guided us into identifying that uh, if we can start to look at controlling that, uh, that exotherm, uh, we can look at the formulation, make some modifications to it, and we did. Uh, we got rid of that exothermic uh, behavior at the uh, the initial spike, which led immediately to the uh, 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 to the uh, the successful printability of the resin. That ended up going into uh, now what is uh, buildability. So you have a printable resin. How large can you make the part? Uh, and that was uh, presented. We did a, a, a CAMEX presentation last year, uh, which won a best paper award on sparse to solid transition, which I'll go into more detail in a, in a second. But basically, the sparse to solid transition allows for an, a manufactured porosity at, while at the same point allowing for solid perimeters along the entire surface to give us near net shape parts that can be milled into the, their final shape, which you saw in the video uh, demonstrating the uh, large uh, um, 1,000 pound part that we had. And then moving forward is pumpability. Uh, we work with MVP who are experts in, in pumping uh, solutions. Uh, basically formulations can be improved to uh, give us faster flow rates while also maintaining uh, the, the other criteria for printability and buildability. And that's something that's moving forward. Now, um, <clears throat> Basically, we have, uh, uh, again, two systems that we've, we're currently working with on the large scale system, uh, the vinyl ester PRD 1520. Uh, those are uh, good for low heat applications, quickly remove parts. Uh, they have a TG uh, around 107 degrees Celsius and, uh, and they do exothermal on the print bed, but again, they're ambient, so you can, uh, ambient cured, so you can pull them off when you're done uh, printing. So it gives you quick turnaround time on the parts. Uh, that you want to produce. Uh, Dixie Chemical, on the other hand, uh, that's a latent cured system. Epoxy and hydride is what we work with. Those have uh, high heat applications, so those were uh, developed uh, in-house by ORNL with Dixie Chemical to produce uh, autoclavable temperatures, uh, TGs that were above 220 degrees Celsius. They did have to be post-cured in an oven, but we, uh, we have examples of both of these uh, moving forward. Uh, to give you an idea of, of kind of what this looks like, uh, what we typically look at is small scale printing. Uh, small scale printing gives us an ability to test mechanical properties of, of a material formulation, which helps guide us for uh, the, the system we're looking at. Um, it, once we did that, we took uh, the resin and uh, hardener uh, in, in this epoxy case, for instance, and had two separate um, 
uh, transfer pumps, which uh, would have basically the epoxy in one side and the anhydride in another. But you can see here that there's the consistency. These are very thick. They have a, uh, they're a little bit um, more stiff than uh, peanut butter, for instance. Uh, but uh, that's about the, the area that we're, we're working with, the, the, the level of, uh, of viscosity. And, and so there's, there's a lot that goes into uh, how, how do we design these. So again, I said that you know, we work with small scale printing. In this particular case for autoclave tooling, we knew that there was uh, different types of anhydride systems we could use for as a hardener. There was also an effect of uh, uh, the amount of filler that we put in. In this particular case, we used a, a clay filler, which uh, the clay had an effect on the TG, as well as an effect on the, uh, the overall uh, modulus and yield stress, leading to uh, differences in printability and pumpability. And so we found one that had the 220 degrees Celsius uh, porosity, or uh, 220 degrees Celsius glass transition temperature and then took that same formulation and went into a large scale formulation development. And the whole goal of that was because this wasn't exactly a one-to-one -one system for, for uh, mixing, um, we wanted to match up the viscosities and so find out what the uh, proper clay filler percentage was in each uh, resin stream, the resin and the hardener to get a, a, a good mixing. And you can see here, that we have uh, an actual uh, part that was printed. It was about 30 inches long on both sides, about six inches tall, uh, having various contours. This was intended for an autoclave tool. Uh, a little example of a cross cut uh, of a uh, cured sample is, uh, is shown here in the, in the bottom uh, center. That's actually uh, showing that there's uh, zero porosity in this, in this part, which is, um, something that's very uh, desired for improving your vacuum integrity, which I have examples of uh, in the future. Next slide, please. And that, that part that you see is, uh, is basically a, um, uh, that's, that's utilizing our sparse to solid transition, which means that we have a manufactured porosity, we are able to span these gaps of the infill, and then that allows us to really reduce the weight while also maintaining uh, uh, a, a solid parameter to uh, to machine, and so this is uh, this is a step progression showing basically rectilinear on the left, uh, coupled with a rectilinear grid and uh, a solid uh, skin layer, and then it's getting progressively more into skin layers until you have a completely uh, a, uh, a solid uh, surface at the top. In the PRD1520 vinyl ester case, uh, you have, uh, uh, we, we worked on small scale, uh, worked with five gallon buckets to find out what the, uh, uh, the ultimate uh, formulation was that was ready for commercial level. Once we uh, had a commercial uh, level ready system, uh, we went into uh, scaling that up with, uh, with pollen and, uh, and they were uh, now providing us with 55 gallon uh, drums which uh, MVP has uh, already in their supply for, uh, for uh, resin transfer solutions. And that, that ends up giving us the ability of printing much larger parts without having to do bucket changes as, as often. So that large uh, 1,000 pound part that you saw was effectively about three drum changes, uh, which um, was, uh, that's a substantial amount of volume, but we didn't have to, we didn't waste any of that resin. Uh, from scrap parts or, or, or uh, uh, stop uh, starts and stops that we needed to do, which is a huge advantage of the thermosets. And uh, to give you an idea of this, so the, going back to the exotherm, this is just a brief overview of, of the, the type of setup that we use to determine the uh, uh, exotherm, that overshoot that I was showing. Uh, basically, we use a semi-infinite thin wall structure, look at the IR uh, side profile of it, and take that information, uh, every layer's temperature versus time data, and then compare that with a numerical model from finite element analysis. And the, the numerical model utilized a, a reaction kinetics term, which in order to generate that for a complex system like a, a thermoset reaction, we used a generalized reaction rate law based off of an adiabatic temperature rise experiment. And that gave us very good results with what we saw experimentally on it. Next slide, yeah, okay. 
Now, sparse to solid, this is, uh, this is a huge advantage uh, for us. Uh, thermoplastics already have the ability of printing infills, uh, but they can also span gaps, which can uh, uh, allow for manufactured uh, porosity and light weighting. We wanted to prove that we could do that as well with the large scale thermoset system. That's why here you see that we have a, a, a series of tests where we go ahead and uh, span over a gap of a known length, find out what the critical gap is before we get fiber uh, filament breakage. And then at that point, uh, we can then, uh, you can observe here that in some cases you'll see sag across that span, which then tells us that we need to have uh, a certain amount of uh, layers to be put on top of that, uh, that previously deposited bead. And so the number of layers that we stack on top until we get to our programmed height is giving us our minimum amount that we need in order to basically correct for the sag that we had. And in order to improve that, we have a, a, a new intermediate uh, uh, infill pattern that we use, which is grid. Uh, typically grid you can do on a small scale thermoplastic system, but what it does is it passes through previously deposited beads that ends up breaking the filament. On a large scale thermoplastic system, you would not be able to do that. It would, it would crash uh, your, your system. In the thermo uh, set case, we are able to pass through the previous deposit beads, which means that in that grid uh, formation, every vertice of the, of the mesh is, um, is at the same height. We don't have valleys that we have to span across when we do the solid layers. And you can see here that the cross section of both these uh, ambient and latent cured systems do show that manufactured porosity and the, uh, the overall uh, skin layer that can be milled. And uh, finally, before I send it back to Mike, I'll just uh, comment on the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the diameter of, of what we print with can be changed on this system. So since we're using a paste, uh, it's it's very uh, it's it's pressure limited, but we can actually go ahead and change the diameters to various sizes. So we've done things from 0.3 inches down to 0.05 inches for a diameter, and what that allows us to do is have really high resolution parts. Uh, high resolution can uh, mean that we have uh, end use applications that can be uh, directly used after uh, after printing, or you can reduce the amount of uh, of uh, material that needs to be taken off during milling. Uh, you can get just get crisper looking uh, uh, finishes at that point. But the, the thing that makes us capable is that uh, the, the fast gantry speed that we can print at on this system. So the, the MVP RAM can go up to 50 inches per second, which means that if we're typically uh, looking at say 0.2 inches diameter for a, uh, a nozzle, what we find it ideally is that um, uh, we have a uh, gantry speed of 2.7 inches per second. When you decrease the uh, the diameter by two, uh, to uh, keeping the mass flow rate constant, you can actually do the, the math. It just means that you have to increase your gantry speed by a factor of four. So uh, that's why you see that, that trend there that when we go from 0.2 to 0.1, we go to from 2.7 to 10.8. And when we go to 0 0.05, we're roughly around 40 inches per second. So that's pretty much uh, uh, our limit. If we wanted to go uh, smaller, uh, we would have to work on formulation and also uh, the, the mass flow rate uh, would have to be considered. So as, as Chris has detailed, right, those are some of the really big advantages on the material side. And as I mentioned in the beginning, right, this is a, a marriage of being able to uh, utilize some of the advantage of both the materials and what you can do with the materials, but then what you can do on the machining side as well from some of those advantages. The pick and play system is, a, is a, uh, able to function because of that thermosets are, have this open layer time. So you, again, don't have to come back to a previously deposited bead as fast as you might with a thermoplastic. And secondly, because of the different work that we've done uh, the, the be able to, uh, the, the material is malleable or you're able to push into some of the material. So this is an example using the uh, PRD system that we were, we used to pick in place. So in this example, you can see some of the, the print, you can see some of it going through print um, 
it's printing across itself. So it's doing some print through in some of those pieces. And obviously this is a really kind of a, on our system, a, a small piece, but the head goes over, grabs a grabbing arm, grabs a, a secondary piece. So you could be dropping in, again, thermocouples or different sensing data or dropping in a, a female screw section so that you don't have to do um, post process or do post type items to this to this part uh, and then you can continue printing but furthermore what if you wanted to lightweight this in some way or you wanted to add some type of structure on the inside so the system went over grabbed a piece of foam it's dropping it in the in the obviously in the spot where it was meant to be and then it goes back and then now it can go and print across it and cover up that piece that you may need inside of uh, inside of your print And then again, it does some of the print through type items. And, and now you have the ability to, to go and grab different items in the system. And the system is doing this all for you. And again, what's allowing this is that open layer time and the, and the different material usage. Another advantage of using the thermal sets is you're able, again, because of the open layer time, you're able to print multiple items at once the video that i showed of that very large print that was taking up the majority of the print bed but if you have smaller articles you can still print multiple things at once this is just a still frame of a video but you can see there's obviously there's three different pieces here this is um, something we were planning on showcasing at, at jec this year but uh, not only are you printing three different things at this point but you're printing something with a different geometry at the same time as well so you're able to optimize uh, the time on the machine, even though you are using a smaller or printing a smaller article, you're able to more efficiently use uh, the machine time. And then secondly, in this picture, that's a oak, the oak leaf in the top center there. The stem of that oak leaf, you can kind of see, and I apologize, we probably could have had a better picture here, but the, the oak leaf itself, whoa, computer, is uh is turning and so this is the beginning development of a overhang work so as as you're able to step out as that as the layer is um starting to stiffen up enough now you're able to layer onto the previous uh, layer at an at an angle and and we hope to get somewhere in the range of 45 degrees at some point soon but this is kind of the the beginning stages of that development of the overhang and then this year we've also spent a lot of time um, working on the software side of the of our system because of the testing and the uh, different processes that we've learned through the what the tests are showing us we're able to now incorporate that process into how we want to change the the print speeds or or different things that are happening within the printer so for example, if uh, exotherm or the, the system is sensing that the print is, is getting too warm or that it's, it's curing too fast, the, the system itself can slow down the, the printing and let that kind of catch up. Uh, I guess I should say that you can see a, a, a screen capture of the interface on the, the software system. There's a bunch of gauges in the bottom right and the bottom left, there's some uh, on the fly type gauges or, or um, that, um, pulleys that you can kind of pull to, to change the different parts of the, the speeds of the, of the system um, and then some other inputs and then what's happening on the system is in the main part of the screen. Uh, other things that can happen are your, you may get air in, uh, there may be an air bubble in your, in your material or um, there's just you know lots of different things that can kind of happen as you're as you're using some of these materials. So there's wow, that is the second time that's happened. Um, there's alarms that are now incorporated in the software system that allows you to either pause the print or uh, make adjustments on the fly so that your your print continues to go smooth. So. Uh... 
it wouldn't be large scale uh, additive manufacturing without talking about why additive in the first place. And right now, what we're looking at, uh, like most areas, is the area of tooling. So you've seen some examples so far. I'll show you, show some demonstrations here that we have. Uh, Mike, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so first of all, it was uh, thermoforming tool production. So uh, we've, with the, uh, the the vinyl ester system, what we looked at was uh, uh, basically, can we make a, can we make a tool? That, this is the first tool that we ever did, the thermoforming application. And we did two different ways. We did a lattice print and a solid print. The solid print being done by sparse to solid transitions, as you uh, as you saw before. Um, in the case of the lattice print, we went into a coating system, uh, and then from there, uh, both the solid print and the coated uh, system were actually milled into their final shape. And then we sent that off for testing, and were able to pull apart. So there was a uh, between the the actual printed part and then the coated part, uh, they both performed uh, very well over multiple um, uh, multiple test pulls. You can see that uh, that uh, demonstration piece right there. One of the advantages of the uh, uh, of the sparse to solid transition that we had in this system was the fact that that manufactured porosity that was located at the bottom of the part actually created uh, vent holes in which you could uh, drill directly through the surface of your part and then be able to pull a vacuum through the bottom. And so you didn't have to worry about uh, drilling all the way through the uh, part, only through that top surface. And it that's the, the result that you see here. Uh, another type of uh, uh, process that was vacuum bond tooling. So this really was just one of those, uh, you just get it out the door quick. So we received the CAD part and we had a tool, uh, two tools actually in less than three days. So you can see here that we took the CAD we went with the ambient cure uh, system, did the whole uh, uh, multi-print uh, aspect of it, took those parts off the bed, and then just sent it right to the mill, and we were uh, and we were ready to uh, ship out to uh, the the customer for testing. Uh, another uh, aspect which uh, you you saw a video of right now is a large hand layup tool. Uh, so that uh, basically again progressed over uh, kind of a, a 80 hour print time, which if you think about it is 10, eight hour uh, days. Um, and so uh, it wasn't done all continuously. It was done in periodic uh, uh, points in time. And we were able to get that final part. You can see the magnitude of size that we're talking about here by looking at that whole print bed on the upper right picture. That's, uh, that's the part that's right there. Uh, cool aspect about this uh, is that uh, we don't need a heated bed in order to print on. We print it directly on this pallet, and the resin system was to, uh, has a adhesive nature to it, so it was able to physically bind itself to that pallet, and uh, and that uh, also creates an insula uh, insulative layer, which helps uh, the uh, material to um, uh, reach gelation faster and have a more consistent uh, thermal profile. Uh, but we can print on any kind of substrate. It can be uh, it can be wood. It can be aluminum. I mean, it really depends on whatever the application is. But you can see we pulled that part off the bed, hoisted it up uh, on our crane over at the manufacturing demonstration facility at ORNL, and loaded it right up onto the uh, the mill for uh, uh, for alignment and milling. Next is. Uh, uh, our autoclave tool production. So you saw that the latent cured system from the Dixie and hydride system uh, requires a post cure, well, an actual cure in an oven. It does not harden on the print bed. But so you see that this is what the part looked like uh, on the print bed in the upper left. Then we went ahead and cured it. Uh, did a cure cycle for about 90 C for an hour just to bring things up to temp. And then we went from 150 C for two hours to 220 C for another two hours. Uh, and that reached a, a full cure through the entire part as demonstrated by cross sections of other parts that we worked on and uh, set that up on the mill um, and then actually went ahead and, and then once it was milled, we went through a, 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 about a 600 grit sanding. And from there with no coatings on it, this had no porosity on the surface such that we were able to pull a vacuum after laying a vacuum bag on it as part of our vacuum integrity check. And we reached minus 29 inches uh, mercury, which was the limit of our vacuum pump. 
And then it dropped about 1.2 inches mercury after five minutes, which was a, a, a very solid success uh, in, in our eyes uh, for uh, one of the, uh, the first large scale thermo uh, uh, set uh, autoclave tools to come off the printer. So a lot of capabilities in this uh, moving forward uh, in, in, our, uh, in, in the parts that we have. So with that, uh, we, we're always working on this. Uh, we've got a lot of things that we want to work on. Obviously, material uh, advancements are something that we're, uh, we're constantly uh, working with uh, partners on. Uh, production validation. So a lot of the tools that you saw here, uh, so we've, we've tested uh, many of them, but we're uh, able to put out a lot. So we've got uh, still several that we want to test there. Uh, pick in place, the, that's, a, that's a very unique feature to this, uh, this design, this system. And it can allow for a lot of integration of sensors, which is something that we're going to be uh, putting in. Wireless sensors, uh, thermocouples, uh, heated, uh, heated, uh, uh, um, uh, cart heated cartridges, for instance, to, to get uh, uh, localized heating or cooling channels if we need it. Uh, and then uh, basically Im improving the, the thermal and electrical properties of these molds too. There are a variety of end use applications as we talked about. Um, and then as you saw a quick demonstration of, we, we are working on some, uh, some overhangs and, uh, and, and also the surface finish being improved by not only coating technologies, but also uh, that fine resolution of using uh, different nozzle sizes. So definitely wanna start producing very large parts with very fine nozzles and see how well we can uh, uh, get the, the surface finish to improve. And Mike, I'll let you take the next slide. So you're on, you're on mute, yep. <laughs> so yeah, just the acknowledgements, we'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in the project. Um, Pollen and Dixie, Mater Dixie Chemical from the material side and some of the uh, end use partners that we've We've worked with that just a couple of them are listed here as they were in the slides, but there have been others and, and we continue to have more uh, more end use uh, production ready kind of tooling that we're, we're, we're doing case studies on currently to, to showcase. And uh, we appreciate obviously uh, Oak Ridge and the MDF and everything they've done for us. And that is our presentation. And I think we, I'm not sure what time it is, but I'm sure we'll grab, have some, uh, have some questions if anybody would like to reach out to me if with um, any additional questions that we might not be able to cover right now, there is my contact information there and you're welcome to, uh, to get a hold of me, questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you so much, Mike and Chris. That was a great presentation. We do have questions. And we're going to try to move those through those as quickly as possible. If we don't get to everything, um, we will be recording this. It will be available online, and our speakers today will be reaching out. Okay, so how does the CTE of these uh, printed tools compare to metals such as Invar? Yeah, so uh, the CT, I mean, the CT of of these uh, polymers are are higher than you will find in in, in a lot of your. I mean, Invar is, is already designed to be a very low CTE uh, system. So we're, we're probably in the range of, um, uh, I, I believe we're about uh, tw um, 25 uh, in, in terms of uh, some of the aspects that we're, we're looking at. Uh, what you need to keep in mind though, is that uh, with these systems, we can actually work with isotropic fillers um, and, uh, get isotropic properties out of it. So like in thermoplastic AM, your build direction, uh, its properties uh, between layers is governed by uh, basically polymer chain diffusion. Uh, whereas in, in this case, we have uh, chemical uh, cross-linking between the layers. So we actually get a very uh, improved Z direction uh, in terms of properties. And if we add into it isotropic fillers, we can also get isotropic properties like that. Okay, um, with the latent cure systems, do you have trouble with the viscosity decreasing when the heat is added, I guess in like post-cure, before the material starts to gel and get more rigid? Uh, yeah, so basically um, in the latent cure system we have right now, uh, it will, 
it will slowly react during uh, uh, during the, the the print process. So it'll take about three days, and then it's sol it's a B stage effectively. It's enough that we can pull it off the bed and put it in the uh, in the oven. Uh, if if you take it as is, uh, one way to, your viscosity will decrease. You can have uh, deformation or dimensional instability uh, in the uh, in the uh, cure cycle. So basically, uh, what we what we do is we can increase the density of the infill, which does improve the uh, the uh, the wall integrity, the surface integrity. Um, you can also uh, have it if you have a particular system that can do more of a, a slow ramp rate, uh, maybe a, a, an isothermal hold at a lower temperature where your viscosity hasn't quite dropped down, but you do have some reaction going on. Uh, that That is also uh, possible. But for right now, we are looking at a, uh, we do have a B-staged uh, system. Do you think that this system could be used for printing uh, with BMI resin, bismalliamide? Yeah, bismalamide. Uh, I I do think it could. I think that uh, uh, one one thing with bismalamides is that uh, a lot of times and it, it can be if you can get it into a paste form. That's a that's the one thing. So uh, some bismalamides are actually uh, based on uh, solids, and so they have to be uh, preheated in order to get them into a liquid state. That that's not currently system ready for it, but there are also, say, uh, your uh, bismalamide triazines, which can uh, be a, a blend of different components that in which we could look at uh, potentially getting that. But that would be a, uh, something we would work with MVP on in, uh, in their pumping experience uh, for 2K or even 3K components. All right, this one will probably be the last question. Um, we've had two questions about open time. How long can you delay before you start to get um, a, a reduction in the chemical bond? How, how long can you go for the open time? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Uh, we're currently uh, investigating that right now. Um, I will say that uh, with, uh, with COVID, uh, coronavirus, and, and a lot of places having uh, mandatory quarantines, the, the question that you really have to say, can it last 14 days if you were quarantined on the subject? Uh, I, will, I, I will say that um, we don't uh, notice any, anything from a performance standpoint after milling yet. We are still in the process of uh, testing uh, actual mechanical strength and should have that data uh, actually within the, uh, within the next month. So it's, it's an ongoing investigation. For sure. But you said right now you've printed during one day, let it sit overnight and finish printing the next day. Is that the longest you've gone? No, uh, the, the longest we've gone has been about two weeks of, uh, of, of no okay. printing. So uh, that, that, is, that is something that is a big advantage. Again, not every system can do that. You have to have a system that has in some way uh, an ability to be almost like an adhesive. So the vinyl ester system that we have uh, does have that that kind of capability where it can uh, adhere to other systems, especially like with the printing on plywood, it, it, it adhered very well to that and, and itself. Well, thank you again to Mike Castura and Dr. Chris Hershey. Um, we appreciate both what uh, MVP and ORNL have done with this system. Thank you for the webinar and answering our questions. And thanks to all of our attendees. I do encourage you to reach out um, to Mike and Chris for more information. And we appreciate everybody continuing to uh, hang in there and want to learn more with these webinars. We hope to see you again soon at the next Composites World webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all.